open up to Mark chapter 10. Two more announcements while you're turning there. We've been raising money in October and September for the building project. I shouldn't actually just qualify or quantify it to those two months. We've been raising money every single month for the last 10 years, saving money for our big project. You guys know this is like week 36 or something. In the Foursquare building, we don't own this building. We're just borrowing it, and we're actively preparing to move back to South Beach as the Lord would allow us to expand our building on the hill. So we're asking you guys to prayerfully consider giving of your tithe and offering, as you should, as the Bible instructs us to. But then additionally, beyond that, in September, September, October, November, December, give an additional gift, something that the Lord will put on your heart. The Lord put a number on my family's heart last year when we did this, and every single month we did it, and we're doing it again this year as well, dipping into our savings and just giving that to the Lord, trusting that he's going to be honored and take care of us, which he's doing both. So I wanna give you guys an update. We wanted to raise $100,000 in October, and we had a family come forward that says, hey, we're gonna help you guys do that. We're gonna match anything that South Beach Church gives to that end, and so, so far coming in, in October, from the South Beach Church family, Family, before the match has been $33,000 coming in extra. You can clap for that. <laughs> to remind you guys, we had $106,000 coming in September, so you guys are generously giving in the next month, 33. So if you're 33 times two, if that's been matched, that's $66,000, which means that we need to make how much more money before today's over? 34, we're gonna call that 17. 17,000 with another match. So if we can get $17,000 given this week, so today and the rest of the week, you can give online. You can send checks to PO Box 950, Newport, Oregon. Lots of ways to give and to contribute. And just say, Lord, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna do this? The Lord's gonna do it. How many guys are choosing to believe biblically that the Lord's gonna do it his way, not our way? He's gonna provide for all of our needs. He's gonna get all the glory. We put together a quick video. This about, it's not quick, actually, it's three minutes long. This video details the last four Four weeks on November, nope, October 6th. Remember, we had the dedication of the foundation. We went out there on our fourth service. 300 people showed up. It was radical. We did a little bit of clips of that. The very next day, uh, October 7th, the building showed up and they dropped it off. And then the very next Monday, they began to erect it. So, this is three parts of what's happened in the last three weeks. It's a three minute video. Dave, play the video, turn the lights down.
And we'll have more footage in the next couple weeks as the crews get underway. Today is Sunday, and then tomorrow there'll be another five-man crew, three- or five-man crew, every day this week, Monday through Thursday, working four tens in the weather as well. They can work in the rain. The wind is where it gets a little weird putting up those big steel beams. So pray for good weather and for good attitudes. It was really awesome. I went up there this last week, and I hadn't, I've been traveling, so I hadn't actually met the steel crew, just a quick testimony. So I went up there with my daughter after some evening events, and we were the only ones on the pad walking around. It's kind of a dangerous area, and so we decided to test the steel. I'm just kidding. No, no, we stayed away from the steel. We were on there, and so this guy comes out of nowhere. He was in his truck there kind of watching and monitoring, and he didn't know who I was, and so he came up, and he was real nice. He's like, look, you know, I, I realize everyone wants to be on the pad, but I got I to gotta kind of ask you guys to, to move off the pad. You know, I don't know, think he knew who I was, and so I just sat there and, and said, okay, yeah, what's, what's your name? And his name was Bruce, and, and I introduced myself who I am, and I didn't want to be like a jerk or anything and say, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm who I am. Anyways, and, and so we, we, we became good friends, and I started sharing testimonies with him of the property and of our pursuit and what God's been doing in me and in our church over the last 11 plus years. And he listened to every single word and he wanted to know more. He said, this is so encouraging being here. He lives in Vancouver, he's a Christian, goes to church up there and he says, this makes this project so much more special that we're a part of this and it was so radical to see all that God has done in us and and as he's putting the steel together and the concrete and the foundation, it's really all about the people. It's really all about what God's doing in your heart and in my heart. In Bruce's heart, he'll be out there. Every single person who's had a chance to be up on the, on the property, maybe you've never been up there. Maybe you're just praying, and you're waiting, you're writing checks and trusting God. You're part of the building project as well. And so we thank God that he's working in us. All, it's just a building. People have different opinions. Oh, yeah, the church should be smaller and just meet house to house. Well, we're gonna need a lot of houses if we're gonna do that, you know, and, and, and all the rest. And we just wanna glorify God in what we're doing. So let's pray one more time before we get into God's word. Father, in Jesus' name. Would you continue to build us? Lord, the Bible says in 1 Peter that we are living stones being fit together, a house of worship for the Lord. And so in Jesus' name, Lord, would you just kind of shave off the rough edges today? Would you make us more smooth? Make us fit, Lord, exactly how you want. Make us more shiny, Lord, less dull. May you shine upon us. We thank you, Lord, for the money and the provision you've given thus far. We trust you to lead us further, to give us wisdom as the financial teams come together, as those who've donated, Lord, time. We've had even people in our congregation, Lord, sign over their estates when they die. They said, it's all going to the church. That's all I can do. And you guys can have my house when I go to heaven. It's gonna go to Jesus. And Lord, people are so creative and generous. And so we thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Do more, we pray. Let us be a small part of what you're doing. And even right now, Lord, as we turn to the gospel of Mark, chapter 10, may you work in us something new. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? As a matter of fact, Mark chapter 10, new territory. Read with me verse one. It says, then he arose from there and he came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan and multitudes gathered to him again. And as he was accustomed, he taught them again. Stop right there, eyes up here. Jesus Christ, our savior, on mission, on his way now from the northern region of Israel up in the Damascus region, up there Caesarea Philippi, the tribe of Dan, all the headwaters of the Jordan, he's been up there. And he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they confessed, some think you're John the baptizer and some Jeremiah. Everyone's got an opinion. And he said, well, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, that's it. I'm changing your name and I'm gonna build my church upon this confession. And then since then, as Jesus declared, by the way, I love that quote, I will build my church, Jesus Christ. That's what he said, I will build my church. It's the first time in the Bible we have that word church mentioned. The rule of first mention comes into place then. The word is ecclesia. It means called out assembly, a group different, set apart. Not like the Old Testament believers, but a New Testament, a new covenant. Jesus said, I'm gonna build that church. And if Jesus is building something, how much do we have to worry about it? Nothing, we could take it to the bank. He's gonna build his church, which is a group of people. It's not buildings and budgets and buses, it's bodies. It's men and women like you and me. And if we trust the Lord, then he went from there and began a series of teachings and debates and battles. And he found himself going to the mountain of transfiguration and right down into a family drama situation with demons and chaos. And then last week, 
We saw Jesus walking with his boys and they were arguing over who's the greatest. And they were arguing over silly things and Jesus, the master teacher, the master shepherd, continues to build his church. And I, for one, am forever grateful that I get to be a part of it, that I get to show up and read the word, read the textbook, read the instructions, read the manual one more time and say, Lord, give me my marching orders today. Show me what you want for me today. And as Jesus then goes up from the northern area down to the southern area across the Jordan, he gathers, and it says in verse 10 very explicitly, he rose and went to that region and gathered to him again multitudes, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. Stop right there, eyes up here. Jesus never varies from his methodology. He would go to different places, but his methodology was gathering together and teaching people. He was a master teacher. The rabbi loved to make sure his students knew what was going on. Now, this is a two-way road. Have you ever been a teacher of a class and your students aren't wanting to be taught? You've been in a place like this before? <laughs> it's the worst. Have you been in a place before, though, where you're a teacher, an instructor, a mom or a dad or a coach, and your athletes or the people there getting instruction, they want more of what you have to offer? Oh, this is magical. This is powerful. And let's commit to these two things. Let's commit to being a Bible church. This is what Jesus was doing. He's teaching the word of God. Not every church that's gathering right now is teaching the word of God. Did you know that? There's a temptation for some churches to veer outside of God's word. They teach other things. Some churches even gather together and they go through book studies, probably really good books, popular books and powerful books, but, but not the book. And I don't wanna throw any churches under the bus too far, but I wanna hold us accountable. Some churches actually gather together and instead of teaching the Bible, they teach from the Bible. Some churches actually teach about the Bible. It's very, very close, very, very close. But there's a difference between teaching about the Bible and from the Bible and teaching the Bible. And when you go through the word and the word goes through you and you teach the Bible simply and simply teach the Bible, I believe this is how lives are transformed. This is how your foundation is built. This is how your roots go deeper. This is not only gonna have to happen on Sundays. Hold me, hold us accountable. As a matter of fact, some of you who saw the foundation being laid there a couple weeks ago, when the concrete trucks showed up, we brought a 125-year-old Bible that was from my great-great-grandfather who was a church planter in Montana, in Ida or, or North Dakota. And we decided, I decided, I said, you know what? Let's put this Bible in the foundation lest we ever feel tempted to drift lest our foundation go from God's word because it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. So we put the whole Bible in the foundation. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but this also has to do with your home life, the way you minister to the Lord in the morning and he ministers to you. I like devotionals. I've got two or three that I choose from depending on what kind of inspiration I need in the morning and if I wanna get kicked in the neck or if I wanna get you know, pat on the back, I got different writers that do these things for me. But the word of God, I, felt, I sensed the Lord a couple days ago, I was reading through the scriptures and I had a little bit more time, I'd gotten up earlier and, and had a little bit more time and the Lord says, good, I'm glad you did that. You need to spend more time in my word today, I'm preparing you for what's going on. And I began to read one of the Psalms, I think it was the 25th, I read through the Psalm 25 and, and I read through it and the Lord says, hey, read it again, you read that way too fast. And so I just went back and I read it slower and I kind of got, you ever read the Bible and get distracted while you're reading the Bible? And all of a sudden you're through, like three, through three verses but you've also made like seven decisions throughout the day, you're like, and I was doing that. And the Lord says, stop doing that. Stop doing that. Go back and read that again. And the Lord is teaching me a lesson, saying, Luke, you're busy. You're doing all kinds. Of, man, you, just, you, you need to spend this time with me in my word. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. Okay, what are we going to do? We're going to go to the concrete plant? We're going to go to the architects? What are we doing? Jesus said, no, I'm going to sit down and teach you. And people are going to gather together. And they gathered by the crowds, by the multitudes. As was his custom, he taught them again, it says. And as was their custom, they showed up and sat down again. And again, I hate to belabor such a simple point, but I think it's important that we continue to be hungry for God's word, that we avail ourselves to God's word. Sin will keep you from this book, you've heard that before, and this book will keep you from sin. It's just the way it is. A Bible that's falling apart usually indicates a life that's not. The devil wants us to do other things and to join groups and, and even pray and, and serve and be benevolent and kind, all great things. But what we need most is instruction in God's word, to be reminded, to be fed. Jesus said you can't live by bread alone, but you have to have God's word daily, the daily bread, the daily manna. Remember in the Old Testament when they gathered their bread 
Remember the manna? How weird was that? They woke up one day, like, we're super hungry. Ah! And there's manna everywhere. And manna literally meant, what is it? It's like, what is it? I don't know, try it out. Sometimes you're reading the Bible, like, man, what is this? You know, And you just put it in, let the Lord do the work. And they would gather the manna there in the Old Testament, you'll remember. And when they were instructed, they said, grab enough for the day. That's all you can get. And they said, well, there's more everywhere. There's so much. You ever read the Bible before? Like, there's so much. It's too much. You get overwhelmed. This is too much. Just get enough for the day. It's all you can handle. They were actually instructed in those days that if you grab more than you need, let's just go ahead and be that type A person. Let's go ahead and get enough for the next six months. Let's grab it all. They were instructed that's not going to work that way. It's actually going to go bad. How weird is that? That the Lord disallowed them from getting enough for today to last tomorrow. He said, no, tomorrow you got to get a fresh dose. we got to meet daily. This is how any good relationship is going to be. Can you imagine meeting with somebody once or twice a year or every so often? It wouldn't be a very good relationship. Maybe somebody you love, maybe somebody you're married to. Like, I'll see you in like six or seven weeks, you know, whatever, you know. No, you got to meet with that person somehow every day. You've got to connect with them. Well, Jesus here, as was his custom, gathered to them and he taught the people. And I'm so thankful, but check it out. Verse two, uh, it says the Pharisees, they came and they asked him saying, hey, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? I've got that word testing him circled and underlined because it shows their heart and attitude. They really weren't curious about the things that the other group of believers were listening to and receiving and feeding on. These guys, it's actually indicated in the structure of this sentence that they continued to rail on Jesus and to bait him into a argument in order to entrap him into saying something silly. Has anybody ever baited you into an argument before where all of a sudden you're saying silly stuff before? This is the story of my life. I just zip it now. <laughs> Someone wants to fight, I'm like, I can't hear you. I, can't. I don't wanna say anything dumb. These guys were trying to test Jesus. They actually didn't care about the question they were asking. The question is an important question, by the way. We're gonna dive head in and study this out today. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. And I just wanna, again, underscore their hearts and attitudes. Man, when you show up to read the Bible in order to criticize it and to test it and to pick it apart, man, you're doing it wrong. We need to go to the Bible and say, Lord, here I am again. Would you test me? Lord, would you pick me apart? Lord, would you make me new? Would you show me where I'm wrong and where I need to be straightened out? Instead, these guys had this antagonistic attitude coming towards Jesus to test him. Now, in that day, when they asked Jesus this question, divorce was a hot issue. It was debated on many sides. It's a hot issue in today's day. 2,000 years later, it's debated on many sides. And so when they asked Jesus this question, they were hoping to have Jesus pick a side, therefore offending one large group of the crowd that had gathered and messing with Jesus, causing division and schism and ism. This was their heart. They weren't peacemakers. They were the opposite of this. And so they're asking Jesus what the Bible says and what he says specifically about divorce. And we're gonna see that Jesus does speak about divorce a little bit, but check it out. He speaks about marriage a lot bit. He talks about divorce because it's an issue, it's a real thing. But then he says, I'd rather talk about marriage because that's really what God gave to us. And that's the beautiful thing. And that's what God wants us to receive from him. In those days, there was actually two um, rabbis, two leading rabbis and scholars who spoke to this issue. One was named Halil and the other was Shammai. And both of them were on opposite spectrums. One was very liberal and Halil was his name. And he would say things like, you can get a divorce for just about any reason if you're uh, dissatisfied, unhappy with your marriage. If your wife's cooking isn't that great, she keeps burning your Pop-Tarts, you know. And and he was very liberal and said, there's all kinds of ways you could do it. They had a certain rule there where if a husband just said three times to his wife, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, then that was legal. And Hillel would say, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Go ahead and just move on to the next one, and that's how it's gonna be. Uh, Shammai was on the other side. He said, bro, you should, and I don't think it's that easy. I think you should probably go into this real tippy-toe and not rush into these things. And so there was a division, just like there is today in church worlds, and they wanted to see where Jesus was going to land on this debate. Their desire for the question wasn't for instruction, for knowledge, for righteousness. It was just a fight with Jesus. And uh, the Bible actually is not, in their day, first century, super clear on this issue. You can yeah, email me, uh, pastortoby at gmail.com. And uh, 
there's, there's one section in Deuteronomy, Moses' final kind of hurrah. In Deuteronomy 24, he does give instruction to men. He says, when a man divorces his wife, he must write her a certificate, and he tells it, he qualifies it, for an, for an unclean issue. And that's where Hillel and, and Shammai went into deep waters. They said, what does that mean? Because Moses didn't tell us what that meant. So they decided, well, it must mean this, so he, unfavorable. The, 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 things, are, you know, things aren't great, and so that, that's a reason enough. It's, well, I don't think, that's what, not what he meant. So they decided to go next level, but there's not much in the Old Testament that gives instruction on divorce, except that Moses said, you must write her a certificate of divorce, which would then allow her to live her life better if it's a legal deal moving forward. Now, we know in the New Testament, I'll try and clear some of these muddy waters up for us. In the New Testament, there are other instructions given on biblical divorce. And I'll just say it right up front. The only grounds for biblical divorce are infidelity or adultery, sexual impropriety in those ways. Those are the only grounds for a biblical divorce. And I'm gonna go and unpack that a little bit. Jesus, though, was asked, I'll ask the question from their words, verse two, the Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? Now, they're asking if it's okay within the law. Let's go ahead and just ask this question from our hearts, though. How many of you guys know that divorce is very hurtful, it's very harmful, it's very painful? We all know it's wrong, okay? There's a lot of reasons that lead up to divorce. We're gonna be very sensitive today because there's probably a large majority of our church body that has gone through divorce or lived in a divorced home but we do know that divorce is not the heart of God. You can go ahead and just bank on that. It's harmful and it's hurtful. They wanna know, hey, what do you think about that? What do you mean? Jesus should have said, what do you mean, what do I think about it? Man, it's, it's horrible. It's hurtful. It's harmful. That's just the facts. But sometimes when we already know what God thinks about an issue, don't we still wanna argue about it? We do this. We know what the Bible says about certain things. We're like, let's just find a different verse. Let's find a different verse, you know? Let's find somebody that's gonna okay this activity or this thought process. We do this. We already know what the Bible says about so many things, but you and I are master justifiers. Maybe not on this level, but the Bible says to not do all kinds of things. I'll just give one that's very basic to us. The Bible says not to talk about another person to another person without them being present. It says to go to that person. But we would all say things, well, I'm a verbal processor. So I'm gonna talk to this person about that person when that person's not here because I just need to process. And all of a sudden we find ourselves gossiping and talking about somebody when they're not there. We've all done this. Listen, and then we wonder why there's cancer in our relationships. When you choose to gossip, you know something you shouldn't gossip. You shouldn't talk about somebody behind their back to somebody else. It's, it's unbiblical. We do all do it. And then there's blood in the water Casualties, we all do this. These guys, they already knew what God's heart was and so do you and so do I and may we all repent when we try and fudge a little and justify something. Well, this person will probably entertain this activity or this idea or this conversation with me. <sighs> Jesus here trying to be baited into this conversation. Look at what he says, I love his answer. If you're a note taker, just uh, back to point number one where they gathered to study the Bible. Jesus answered them and said to them, what did Moses command you? Verse three. In other words, what's the Bible say? They're asking him, what does he say? He's like, I don't know, what's the Bible say? Such a good answer. What's the Bible say? It's the authority, it's the word, it's the one that tells you and me what's right, what's wrong, what's in, what's out, what's okay, what's not okay. The, the world we live in doesn't operate this way, does it? We decided just a few years ago, maybe four decades, six decades ago in our country, we were one nation under God, okay? Indivisible and all the rest. We have it on our, on our money, it's printed there, in God we trust. But we all know that the powers that be in the government agencies and the schools and education systems, all of them have said, you know, we're actually, we're actually gonna, we say that, but we're gonna do it our own way. We're not gonna inquire anymore about what God says about relationships and marriage and heterosexual and homosexual activities. We're, we're just gonna do what's popular nowadays, and this is the tailspin of a nation gone amiss, walking away from the principles of God. And there's not much, I could be wrong, what we can do about our nation but there's a whole heck of a lot I can do about my own life. A whole heck of a lot I can do about the way that I ask. I don't know, what's the Bible say about that? What does the Bible say? Sometimes we don't wanna know what the Bible says about a certain issue that we're kinda dabbling in and messing around in. Man, what does the Bible say? Jesus asks them this question, and I believe it's the question we all need to ask. And here's the deal about the Bible, by the way. When you read the Bible, you're trying to find answers. There's a, a few rules for Bible study. Number one, when you read the Bible, you gotta ask this first question, okay? The first question you ask, if you're an American, the first question is, is what does this say about me? Okay, that's your third question. 
When you read the Bible, the very first question you ask is, what does this say about God? What does it say about his character? Maybe you're in a hard text in the Bible. I don't understand this. I don't know what to say about God. How can we discern who God is in this picture? Because the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. When you ask, what's God, how, how does God fit in this narrative? What's going on? The second question you ask yourself in Bible interpretation and Bible study, because he's asking them, what does the Bible say? First question, what does it say about God? Second question is, what does it say about the story? The people in the book. Because we're so quick to get to question number three, what's it say about me? Don't do that until you go through question number one, what's it say about God? Question number two, what's it say about the context? What's going on here in the first century? What's going on? Are they trying to bait Jesus? Is this a healthy conversation or is this a rigged conversation? What's going on here? What does it say in, in Deuteronomy chapter 24 where Moses gives this edict to men when they divorce their wives to make sure they give them a certificate of divorce for uncleanness? What does that mean to them? And ask those questions, get good answers, and finally ask the question, and again, we just raced to question number three, what does this say about me? Because we're consumers, we're Americans, it's all about us. And eh, Try not to do that in your Bible study or interpretation. This is gonna save you, by the way, when you're reading weird texts of the Bible and you're reading a psalm that doesn't make any sense. You're like, I don't know what this says about me. It might not say anything about you. It might have all to do with God and the person who wrote it. And it might put you in a position to worship him better because it's not all about you. Well, these guys asked this question to Jesus. He said, hey, what does the Bible say? This is the key, and I would just encourage, I love our church so much. You guys are Bible gals and Bible guys. And you're becoming Bible guys and Bible guys. There's a guy who sits over here, third service usually. His name's Wyatt. Um, I think it's Wyatt. He's a 19-year-old, just graduated. And he had a cool testimony a couple weeks ago. He said, Luke, after you prayed for me last week, I went on Amazon and I bought this Bible. And you prayed for me and I bought a new Bible and I can't get enough of it. I'm just reading it. I'm so thirsty. I was like, whoa, let's go. Fired up. And hopefully you've had that experience before where you get a new Bible or somebody prays for you and you just want more. And if you're not getting that stirring right now, come up for prayer at the end of this teaching. Say, Lord, just give me hunger for your word. Give me hunger. It's, all of us are gonna become dull of hearing at some point in our lives and we need to be stirred up. Well, these guys just wanted to fight him. And Jesus said, let's go back to the text and see what Moses said. Look at verse four. Well, they said, they had it all memorized, by the way. <laughs> they knew. <laughs> they, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. The Bible actually gives us that credence here. They say to him, gives us instructions. And I already told you the only grounds for biblical divorce are indeed adultery and sexual impropriety. But here there is uh, an allowance given in the Old Testament for a similar thing. And the reality is, is marriage, even though it says in verse four that there is a permission, this is not a good permission. This is a sad permission. Jesus is gonna clarify in verse five, just to give you some context. Jesus hears their answer and listen to what he says. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Stop right there, eyes up here. Jesus clarifies when they said, yeah, Moses said we could do it. And then Jesus gets to the heart of the issue. And he said it was for the hardness of your heart that he gave you this edict. The only reason people ever get divorced, ever, is one reason alone, only one, it's for a hardness of heart. Now there's a million reasons that your heart gets hardened. You can think of maybe more than a million. When your heart gets jaded, it gets hurt, it gets abused, it gets mistreated, there's betrayal, there's neglect, there's all types of things that cause a hardened heart. And Jesus said, yeah, the only reason that divorce ever happens is because of the heart of the issue is an issue of the heart. And I hate to put it that simply for those of you who've been through a divorce and say, Pastor Luke, you have no idea. You have no idea what I've been through. No idea what I suffer. I don't. I don't pretend to. But I do know this. The heart of the issue, every issue, is an issue of my heart. The condition of the dwelling place of God himself. And how that's being protected or how that's being attacked how that's being healed, how that's being presented. And if you don't know and don't understand that you're under attack right now, you need to. The devil's real, spiritual warfare is real. Your brokenness within is real. The world we live in is really broken. 
and the Lord tells you and tells me, guys, yeah, there was a, there was a certificate written. There is a precept, but it's only because our hearts become hardened. When Jesus hears this response from them and then tells us what's really going on, I believe it's an opportunity for you and I to walk into deeper waters, to allow the Lord to do something that only he can do. Not to minimize the pain, not to minimize the betrayal, not to minimize sin. Don't think that's being said today. The Bible actually says that in the, where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Is that good news for anybody but me? Dang it. Where there's sin, where there's issues, where there's problems, God's grace abounds even more. There's provisions for your sin, for their sin, for our sin. And Jesus here, I believe, is profoundly making it simple. But instead of going into deep waters about divorce, which they wanted to bait him, Jesus actually, I believe, spins it in a positive way. Look at verse six. He says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. He now begins to give us a history lesson. Hey, what does the Bible say? And they go back to Deuteronomy 24. And then Jesus says, you know, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's go ahead and see how God's original divine design was. Does this help anybody but you, but me? When we go back to the, bless you, to the original design, the Garden of Eden, because I can go down the list and down the row and say, tell me about all the woes and all the mistakes and all the problems that you've suffered in your life, all the issues that you've had, and they can all be traced back to everything post Genesis 3, when sin entered the world and, ca- and problems and chaos and stress. And yet Jesus says, hey, from the beginning, you know how it was supposed to be? God created them male and female. It's interesting, verse six, God created them male and female. It wasn't a controversial verse about 20 years ago. Nowadays, this verse will get you in trouble. They're like, oh, there's way more than that, Pastor Luke, way more than that, Pastor No, just so you guys know, it's biblical, there's male and female, just so you guys know. Not, not only, yeah, not only is it biblical, it's biological, okay, that's all there is. There's just two. There's two genders in the world, that's it. Everything else is a confusion and a dysphoria, period. And now we've gone in this weird realm where we've decided to take confusion, real confusion and real dysphoria, real problems, and say, well, let's just go ahead and include those in the genders. And that's not the way it needs to be. And you wouldn't do this with other situations and other subjects in our lives where there's confusion. You would instead bring truth and you would bring light and you would do it in a loving way. And Jesus here, in a very hot debate, says, hey, God made them male and female from the beginning. And he goes on to explain marriage. This is so beautiful. Look at verse seven. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. We see this in Genesis chapter two. This is called the leave and cleave principle, where a husband and wife come together by leaving their father and mother. You must leave father and mother and cleave to one another. I see this very important principle when I do young marriages and young weddings. I'll ask the bride and I'll ask the groom about their in-laws. They say the three number one causes of marital stress are money, sex, and in-laws. Okay, those are the three things. Yeah, it's kind of funny. <laughs> and so I'll often ask, hey, how's your relationship with your mom or your dad? Has you got the, the mom, the overhovering mom or the overhovering dad or the dad wounds or the mom wounds and all these things because there is a principle that a Man and woman needs to leave their father and mother. There's no disrespect. There's still honor. It's one of the Ten Commandments. But now they live for the betterment of one another. And this is the marriage and the relationship that matters the most between a husband and a wife. And Jesus helps us to understand that. Look at verse 7 again. They shall be joined together. Verse 8. And the two shall become one flesh. So they shall no longer be two, but one flesh. Now, Jesus gives us a mystery here, and I love this mystery Jesus says that biblical math and heavenly math is one man plus one woman equals one person. One plus one equals one. Whoa, that's pretty serious. And Jesus says, let God join these two together and let no man tear asunder. This is a mystery, by the way, and why is marriage under such attack? Did you know that upwards of 55 or 60% of all marriages in 2024 will suffer divorce? They say that if you've been divorced once, you have a 60% chance of being divorced, 40% chance of making it based on today's standards. Forbes magazine came out with that. This is not Christian. 
40% of marriages will make it, 60% won't. That if you get remarried after your marriage fails, you have about an 80% chance of divorce after that. Only a 20% chance of success on your second and even less on your third marriage. They say that the average length of a marriage is eight years now. After eight years, most marriages fail. I thought that was actually a little bit long. I didn't, didn't realize they were making it that long anymore. But um, that's the average length, eight years, and then they're done. People call it quits. Uh, they say that if you live together before you get married, we call this um, fornication in the Bible. We call this uh, cohabitating together. Uh, and Forbes said that if you live together, you know, trying to test out the waters, make sure we're compatible, which is what the world says to do, save money, lots of reasons to compromise in this area, that your, that your chances of divorce are even higher than 60% if you live together, which is crazy because the world will think, no, we, we did it right. We, we lived together for a couple years and then got married. And yet Forbes has found out that that even elevates the divorce rate even higher. And as I say these things, it's, I got three services today, I've been trying to put all this together, thinking, man, this is, some, this is some heavy stuff. I would say over half a crowd here has been in a, either in a divorced family, growing up that way, blended family, or maybe you've suffered a divorce, a failed marriage. And Jesus here says, this is how it's supposed to be. A man and wife shall leave their father and mother and cleave to one another. And what God joins together, let no man separate. That word separate literally means to pick apart, to destroy. It's not clean. When God makes something together, when God brings something together, you gotta imagine it's pretty strong. Imagine taking two pieces of paper, two individual pieces of paper, and smearing them both with super glue, and then putting them together, and then leaving them together overnight on their honeymoon. It's kind of funny. <laughs> They're, they're together, they're bound, they're glued together. And now imagine after eight years or whatever the case may be, we gotta pull these two apart. We gotta, this isn't gonna work anymore, we have to separate these two. It's not going to work. It won't be clean, no matter what. And I've counseled with couples on both sides of the fence, trying to get them to save, trying to salvage, trying to wait, seek therapy and counseling and forgiveness. And I've heard so many arguments. I've heard the argument of multiple parents. Now my kids will have multiple parents. They'll have two dads and two moms, and it's gonna be better for them. And I said, you need to call Oprah back and tell her to shut up. Wherever you got that from, <laughs> shut up. That's not better. <sighs> Verse nine, therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Check this out in verse 10. <laughs> you can read the companion study in, in Matthew 19. The disciples are freaking out. The disciples actually end this teaching saying, I, bet, I guess we should probably never get married. That's what they say in Matthew 19. It doesn't record it here, but in verse 10 it says this. It says, in the house his disciples asked him again about the matter, and he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Jesus here says it plainly and plainly says it very clear for them to hear. And let me just kind of speak in a serious way. My wife and I have been married 23 years. And I thank God for the grace he's given to us. She was 19 when I married her. I was 23. I expected it to be easier than it's been. <laughs> Being honest. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> and yet at 23 years in, by the grace of God, we continue to move forward, asking God, to, asking God to change us. I'll give a few thoughts. One of my friends was going through premarital counseling, and he was young, and the people doing the premarital counseling asked him, why are you guys getting married? What's the whole point here? It's a good question when you're young. Well, she's hot. That's why I'm getting married. Look how hot she is. Super hot, and I'm pretty hot too, you know can't get married because they're hot. Things aren't gonna be hot forever. Gravity kicks in, hair starts growing where it shouldn't grow, lose it where you don't wanna lose it. Things, things freak out. This couple responded in such a profound way. They said the reason we're getting married is twofold. Number one, to glorify God. And number two, to be refined in the process. The couple doing the counseling said, whoa, let me write that down. <laughs> Did you read a book or something? Nobody gets married for those reasons. To glorify God and to be refined in the process. Where are you at right now in your life? Are you single, are you divorced, are you married? Your challenge right now is to glorify God. 
whatever is going on, I gotta glorify God as a single person or as a divorcee or as a married person. How can I glorify God today? Probably need to deny yourself. Probably need to lift others up and seek to live for the betterment of somebody else and not yourself. Live for somebody else. That's how you glorify God. You do the next right thing. And then the second thing is, is you are refined in the process. What's going on in your life right now? Are you single? Are you divorced? Are you married? It's an opportunity for you to be less and for him to be more by his grace. He'll do it. He'll bless you. He'll meet you right where you're at. Every single time you say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. And here's the good news. Because in this time and in these days, that I want to make sure you hear this loud and clear. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. It's not the one sin that can't be forgiven. That's not it. The one sin that can't be forgiven is not allowing Jesus to forgive you of your sins. If you got a divorce and there was sin in that divorce and you've repented of that sin, you have been forgiven. You have been restored. You have been elevated back to righteousness. I would also say this though, in God's eyes, you're perfect. Just as if you'd never sinned. In life though, and I wanna say this, especially for the young people, there are consequences to our mistakes. There are constant pains and reminders. Every one of us have them, whether it's divorce or some other sin that you walked in and committed. When you're dealing with yourself, know this, you're forgiven. You don't need those past sins to haunt you, even if they're the most recent past. Don't let the enemy have victory in your life. And you get the opportunity to be a peacemaker moving forward. When Jesus was faced with the woman caught in adultery, and they said, Jesus, we're about to stone her. Are you ready? And Jesus said, how about we do this, boys? How about the one in here who has no sin? He cast the first stone, and I'll be right behind you. And one by one, every one of those men who wanted to hurt her and kill her and hold her accountable, every single one of them left. And she looked at Jesus, and he said to her, where are your accusers? I don't have any. He said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Radical forgiveness. Radical restoration. Was her life gonna be difficult moving forward? I bet it was. Was Peter's life difficult moving forward after he had denied the Lord three times? After he failed in the ways he did? I know it was. Was the apostle Paul's life difficult moving forward after he had blown it, after he had made mistakes, after he had repented and been restored? Was it difficult for him? But by the grace of God, we go forward. His grace is sufficient for your needs. He forgives, he corrects, he restores. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may the Lord soften all of our hearts today. May the Lord forgive all of us of our sins. May the Lord make us peacemakers with the men and women around us. These guys came in, I'm at the worship team come up. These guys came in to bait Jesus into an argument, a conversation. Let's get him, let's see what he has to say. And Jesus spun the whole thing. He says, guys, from the beginning, my God had a plan. From the beginning, there's grace and mercy. From the beginning, there's purpose and value. This is what changes everything, is Jesus and his love for us. And his love, listen, knows no bounds. The only bounds that Jesus' love can't go beyond are the bounds that we set up. His love goes beyond if we'll let it. His love goes beyond if we find it. His love goes beyond if we ask for it. Let's turn the lights down low. We're gonna sing a song. And, and I just wanna make space. If you're here this morning and man, you're like, dude, I should have read ahead. This would have been a great day to skip church. <laughs> 10 a.m. service, nobody's showing up now. Hey, we live in a world that's all banged up. The very first story in Genesis chapter three, after the fall, the very first story was murder, brother against brother. I don't know if it can get much worse that fast. And so we live in a world full of landmines and difficulties. It's not a playground, it's a battleground. And our Savior Jesus Christ launched headfirst into that battlefield to save sinners, to restore souls, 
to put lives back together. And if you've been torn apart, like paper, glued together, no more, the Lord looks at you and he says, go and sin no more, you're forgiven. Neither do I accuse you. Know this to be true. If you've repented of your sins, whatever the sin may be, you've been forgiven. You've been restored. You've been set free. And now you are an ambassador of his love and grace. And what the Lord wants for you and from you is that you would set other people free, that you would be a lover of all, that you would be an emissary of grace, that you would be a forgiver that you would be a messenger. And I just wanna allow opportunity, all heads are bowed. If you're here this morning and you need the Lord to forgive you and you need to know that you know that you know that you've been set free, restored, that there is therefore, listen, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you need this for your life, whether you're married still or married once, if you need this and want more of Jesus's grace, would you just raise up your hand right now and say, yes, Lord, I need there to be no condemnation in my life. I wanna walk free. I wanna walk restored. Maybe you need restoration. If you need that, raise up your hand right now and say, yes, Lord, restore the years that the locusts have eaten in my life. You do it, Jesus. I tried, I blew it, they blew it, we blew it, Lord, we couldn't do it. And so we give it all over to you. Would you have your way, Jesus? Would you minister and would you heal? Even now we proclaim the blood of Jesus over our body, mind, and spirit. Have your way, Lord, make us a healing church. And also, Lord, you can put your hands down. If you are married or you know somebody who's married and you, you need help, you need the Lord to intervene, to soften your heart, to restore the joy, to bring back the clarity, to be refined in the process, and to glorify God. If that's your desire, say, yes, Lord. You can raise up your hands right now on behalf of your marriage or those you know, maybe your kids or grandkids. Just raise up your hands and say, yes, Lord, I want my marriage to be a biblical marriage. We want to glorify you and be changed in the process. Forgive us of our sins. Make us more like you. Heal marriages today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Minister your grace, Lord, for such a time as this. Even now, heal every heart in this room, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Let's all stand up and sing a song together. If you need prayer, John and Lucy are going to be over here praying on my right. I'll be on uh, your right over here praying. Let's sing together.